سائر المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم ويحفظوا فروجهم ذلك أزكى لهم إن الله خبير بما يصنعون صدق الله العظيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم زن العين النظر رواه البخاري <coughs> Brothers and sisters a before I begin I want to mention this point that guarding the eyes from lustful glances lustful gazes evil glances just like guarding the ears from inappropriate speech guarding the tongue guarding the heart guarding the limbs this is required of a muslim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran and why I'm saying this is because nowadays this is a very foreign concept. Nowadays in the Muslim community, this is becoming a very foreign concept. People think that there's no part in Islam and this is I think partly because we live in a Western society and in Western society there's so much intergender relations that it's become kind of like Okay, so what the heck? Why, you know, where, where do you draw the line? I mean, you're, you're, you're literally mixing with people all the time. It's intergender relations every second, every minute. And the Western world is in the situation it is partly because of that. But we have to understand this very important point that this is in our tradition. Even saying this, Right, that, that, you know, this is the way that they, this is the way that they differentiate between a extremist Muslim or a moderate Muslim in the matter of controlling the eyes. And this is a very, very unfair and very incorrect type of assessment because of the fact that there are certain clear and explicit verses of the Quran. How would you interpret that? قُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Tell the believing men to lower their gazes, their glances. How do you implement that? And inshallah, we'll discuss that. But I'm just saying is, why, you know, before I begin to discuss this, how do we begin to understand this concept and this issue? Tell the believing men to guard their eyes. Tell the believing women to guard their eyes. So men have been commanded to guard their eyes. Women have been commanded to guard their eyes. From what? From the lustful glance. From the illicit glance. Where you are looking at something and you are looking at somebody in a way that is inappropriate, right? For, for somebody to say that there's no such thing of this in Islam, very sorry to say this, but you are making inkar of ayat of Quran. There are clear verses of the Quran that a person will be making inkar and rejecting. So this is very dangerous, right? There's an interpretation. Let's come to a balanced understanding and interpretation of the verse. that the un unintentional glance is not included in this. Number one, that glance which is not a glance with sinful intent, with lustful intent, this is not included in this. So when we talk about the lustful glance, when we talk about the sinful glance, this is specifically 
discussing, and this is specifically talking about that glance which has evil intent behind it. Now what if you have no evil intent and no good intent? You're just neutral. That is where the, 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 the issue here is. There's a gathering. There's young girls that are coming to that gathering. There's young females that are at that gathering. Said, no, I don't have any lustful intent. But as soon as the eye then falls, then that is where the lust then, you know, it accumulates and then it leads a person to further pursuing. And there's a hadith in Bukhari where there was a young Sahabi and he's on the camel with the Prophet ﷺ. And his head is going like this towards the girls. The Prophet ﷺ just goes like this. He's literally pushing his face away. If there's no such thing as the evil glance, why is the Prophet pushing his face away? He's a young man and he's staring at a young woman. He was literally staring. The Prophet ﷺ took his face and turned it the other direction. There is something in our tradition. So you have, you have people that are saying, no, no, there's nothing. You know, this is all being extremist and is being strict. No, this is not correct. It's like people say, you know, what is the sign of a very extremist Muslim? You know what, what is one of the signs? The person prays five times a day. One of the signs, you know, first, the first sign was he started praying five times a day. Started praying, he started wearing hijab. These are the signs of when a person starts becoming extreme. Halanke, <laughs> what is that? This is just... These are the you know, basic re minimum requirement of a Muslim. This, they're, adding this, they're adding this one to it as well. You know, person, you know, he'll guard his eyes or, you know, he won't sit and have lunch with the young girls at school. Khair, the point is, is that this is something that Allah Ta'ala will ask us about. In wal-basara wal-fu'ada kullu anhum Allah Ta'ala says, In the sama wal basara wal fuada, kulu dhalika kana anhu mas'ula. All of these things are things that will, Allah Ta'ala will ask us about. <clears throat> and in particular, when we go to, now somebody wants to ask this question, well, how do I guard myself? I have to go to school, I have to go to work, I have to deal with females. So then what do I do in that situation? So when you have to go to work, when you have to go to school, then don't deliberately make a habit to unnecessary, unnecessarily look. Sitting in a place and every girl that walks by, and just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Passing by where every female goes and now you're sitting in such a place, just, you know, having a nice glance by everybody. This starts becoming a, a sickness. This starts becoming a disease. That fantasy. You go to school, and you deal with the females that you have to deal with according to your work that you're doing. If you're at work dealing with females according to business, not flirting, not joking, not mentioning unnecessary type of, you know, uh, uh, acting unnecessarily, you know, flirtatious, looking where you're not supposed to look. And basically, you know, d dealing, you know, what is the necessary thing at hand? What, is, what, what, need, what needs to be discussed? What needs to be spoken about? Keeping it at that level. Because this is another thing we have to understand. Every, every, every woman, every sister is not, a, is, not an, is not a sex object. This is another sickness. This is a human being. She's here for the same reason that you are here. You're here to study. Why are you treating this person? And, and unfortunately, this is the way that it's become in colleges. So that having that balanced, moderate, fair judgment that when I have to deal with people, I will deal with people according to, you know, you know talk business, as they say. There's no need for flirtation. There's no need for telling unnecessary jokes. Dealing with a person exactly how it's supposed to be dealt with. Where do all these sexual harassment cases come from? Where does it come from? It comes from that unnecessary going beyond the limit. So the, the beauty of this is, brothers and sisters, it keeps us within our limits. That we have to purify our eyes. If we're going to deal, if we have to deal with you know, an individual. 
You know, we go to the grocery store. We go to the airport. We go to school. We go to work. Dealing with people in a, in a, in a, in a pure, in a clean, and in a pak, in a, in, a, in a manner. To guard yourself from those unnecessary, lustful, illicit, fantasy types of glances. As much as you can. And if you could just avoid the situation altogether, alhamdulillah. But if you have to deal with it, if you have to deal with it, then guarding yourself to the best of your ability, talking about what is business, talking about what is the matter that has to be dealt with. Period. That's it. And continue. Now, there are, there are a couple of parts. Remember that this is written, this was written a while ago. So some of the concepts and these things, inshallah, this book is still going to be edited. But Shaykh, one of our Shaykh Maulana Hakim Akhtar, he had to deal with a lot of people who, because of lustful glances, fall into love affairs, which would eventually make them drop out of school. And this was, you know, in our time, it's... Astaghfirullah, very, very bad that, you know, you have, you know, these apps where people are, you know, dating just for lustful purposes. You have married couples, they are dating just for sexual purposes. You know, this was maybe a little bit of a different time where people would gain feelings for somebody, you know, they would fall in love with someone, they would gain feelings for someone, and then slowly, slowly this would escalate, a person would become... I mean, you, 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 I mean, you have that issue even now. But now, may Allah ta'ala save us, the times have become so bad that you don't even need to, you could just subtract all that love. Subtract all that heartache. Get directly to the lustful action. Let's go directly to business. وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ and we know about that Ashley Madison, and that's Ashley Madison is like old news now, isn't it? So many priests got exposed, you know? They were rabbis, they were priests, you know? These are married people whose name is on their database. You guys heard of that? or You guys haven't heard of that? It's actually a, it's, it's a website where married people can go and there's database, and you can hook up with other married people. So the interesting thing is this book is talking about love affairs. And in actuality, this is not even a love affair. It's a lust affair. You could just subtract all of the in-between unnecessary, right, as they say things, and you go exactly to what needs to be done. Get to business. A'udhu Billah. So this is specifically, you know, from in the time when there was actually you know, I, I don't say haya because you know, eventually it leads to committing an illicit relationship. Having, uh, but it was a time when slowly, slowly, it wouldn't be such an immediate thing where you actually can text somebody you know, looking for a girlfriend, looking for a good time website. You know, you're looking for a good time and you go straight and then that's it. It gives you the address and you go and you do what you need to do. Allah Ta'ala protect us from that. But this is that where it escalates, you know, you have a crush on somebody. Remember that? There was actually crushes at one time. People used to have a crush on somebody, right? Now you just, you know, cut all of that, you know, cut all of that, get the business. A'udhu Billah. But where that, that you know, you, go, you get into that, you first is the evil glance, uh, you know, a, 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 a lustful intention, and then you fall into a crush, and then you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're getting heartbroken and you're feeling miserable and then you're trying to get with her if she doesn't want to be with you and then, you know, you're in a dilemma. Some people end up, you know, hurting themselves, going into drugs or going and in, in, intoxicating themselves or they will go and try to pursue the matter and hurt the other person. So whatever the case may be, the, 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 the inception of that is it starts from right, the evil glance. So there's four sections. Number one is the harms of sinful glances in love affairs. Book two is the cure. 
to these love affairs. Book three is the 14 harms. Book four is on illicit glances. And there's some letters. So I just wanted to read some selected sections of it. If we go to page one, the Shaykh says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in this age, sinful glances and love affairs are the greatest temptation for the people of piety, religious figures, and those treading the path of tasawwuf. Tasawwuf, in other words, a person who's trying to rectify himself, a person who's trying to, you know, be clean, a person who's trying to be righteous, a person who's trying to be pious. Shaitan is able to involve the nafs quickly in this temptation because the apparent hindrances are few. What does that mean? Meaning if I'm standing outside, you're talking to me, and I'm going like this, and I'm looking from the side of my eye, you won't even know. You, you, what, you, you have a bad intention. You know, you had, you're thinking wrong about me. I could easily just, you know, be glancing at every person who walks by, at every female who walks by. You won't even know what I'm doing. A person can be sitting there because this is an internal thing. It's not an external thing. For example, if a, a person has a bottle of beer in his hand, saying, Astaghfirullah, Shaykh, what is this bottle of beer in your hand? It's very, it's very open, it's very obvious. But the matter of the glance is an internal thing. It's based upon intention. You cannot know that a person is doing that. He easily makes one guilty of casting sinful glances at ghayr mahram girls and boys. And if we think that this is something which is, you know, somebody's imagination, why is it that every year hundreds of priests, hundreds of priests and hundreds of people are caught for what? For child molestation. Do we think that this is something khiyali? Sinful glances, lustful glances, lustful intentions. The disease of lust is a real thing. It's a disease and it exists. And it starts here and it starts here. We have to guard the heart and we have to guard the eyes. Is child molestation a problem in this country or it's not a problem? Everybody, is it a problem or no? It's a very serious problem. I mean, there's actually a website where you can go and it says, we can tell you who are the child offenders in your locality. So those people that have children, I have three children. An eight-year-old boy. I mean, you know, it's shocking how people are affected by beauty. My, my, my young son, Muhammad Yahya, he's eight years old. He's a, you know, he has a very fair complexion and he has green eyes. He's a handsome boy, mashallah. So I'm at the register at a, at a grocery store. And the lady, she's probably, I think, late 40s, early 50s. She must be in her late 40s, early 50s. So she looks at my son. I mean, just think about this. When, when evil glances becomes a habit, she's looking at my son. She says, mm, beautiful eyes. I wish you were 20 years older. And I'm like, is that a compliment? Or what is it? I wish you were 20 years older. 49-year-old lady, 50-year-old lady. And she's telling my son, which is a young boy, He's a handsome boy. And she's telling them, I wish, I wish you were 20 years older. I don't know, you know, why would you want him to be 20 years older? Obviously, I want to date you. And this is something which I'm saying is, beauty is such a fitna. Beauty is such an attraction that a young child who is, doesn't know anything about these matters, but the thing is, is that when people look at you, what is the automatic thing that comes? Imagine, by, by her saying this, what she's telling, she's telling you the thought in her mind. I wish he was older, and if he was older, he would probably look like this. And if he would look like this, then I could probably, you know, do this with him. I could probably become intimate with him. What does that mean, I wish you were 20 years older? Meaning, I wish I could be intimate with you. What other meaning does it have? 
And this is just, this is a compliment. But is that something which is appropriate? The point I'm trying to make, brothers and sisters, that this, this matter of becoming overwhelmed by lustful glances, it, it has to do with fantasy. So he easily, yani shaitan, easily makes a person guilty of casting sinful glances at ghayr mahram girls and boys. The statements of Hakim al-Ummah. The harms and calamities caused by having any kind of relationship with ghayr mahram women or handsome youth are so serious that I cannot pen them down. These harms can occur by looking at them, speaking to them to soothe oneself, or sp simply speaking to them in a gentle manner, sitting with them in solitude, by beautifying one's clothes to please them, etc. Meaning, a married man and a mar or a married woman, you know you have to go to the office, you know you have to go to school, there's females there, or there's males there, having this type of relationship with them, where you're looking at them unnecessarily, you're speaking to them to soothe yourself, just unnecessary conversation. Sitting with them in solitude, remember one very important point, brothers and sisters, al-khalwatu bil ajnabiyyati haram. Being in complete khalwa with a ghayr mahram is haram. You should not be in a room, closed doors, alone with the opposite gender. This is not permissible. Or to be, and, and, I, and I also mentioned this, brothers and sisters, whether male or whether female, whoever that you feel inside that you are getting lustful and very shameful thoughts. If you're in a room with a child, if you're in a room with an eight-year-old boy, I'm very, brothers and sisters, I apologize if these uh, issues are making people feel very uncomfortable, but this is a real matter in our communities. This is a real issue in our community, in all of our communities, and not only in the Muslim community, in the Jewish community, in the Catholic and Christian community, it's all, the, all throughout the board. People have this issue. If you feel any sexual attraction towards anyone, immediately leave that room. Do not be alone with that person in the room. If it's for your own daughter, if it's for your own son, Brothers and sisters, these, you know, the statistics are staggering of how many young girls are molested by their own fathers inside of their house. How many young men, young boys are molested by their own family members. Brothers and sisters, this is not, this is not a joke. This is a very serious matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنْ وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ Allah ta'ala knows the treachery of the eyes and that which the hearts conceal. You have to have control over yourself. This is the life of a, a boy. This is the life. Do, you know, do you know what's the... Does anybody know what's the, uh, what's the sentence? What's the verdict of a person who does child molestation? What's the punishment of that in the United States? It's a life sentence. The person who commits child molestation to touch a boy or a girl, you know, sexual with sexual intent, molestation, it's a life sentence. Do you, do you know why it's a life sentence? Why such a harsh verdict? Is because you are actually taking away the life of that child. That person who perpetrates the action of child molestation, you, somebody molests a child. Do you know what you have done? You have actually taken away the life of that person. They cannot ever be normal ever again. It's not possible. It's very difficult. So, brothers and sisters, if a person has a sickness, you have to. This is why we're speaking about this. If you have this sickness, if you feel a lustful attraction 
towards anybody, which is haram for you to have a lustful attraction, except illa ala azwajihim, fa innahum ghayru malumin. Allah Taala says, except for your spouse, and in your spouse there is no blame. Understand this: that you are not allowed to have sexual attraction and feelings and exert those feelings for anybody but your spouse. You are not allowed to sexually advance towards anyone. You are not allowed to sexually advance towards anyone other than your halal spouse. Shaykh Rahimahullah, he mentions here, he says, it is so harmful. The calamities are so much that I cannot pen them down. Yani, how, how, how much should I tell you how evil it is? Sheikh then mentions, love affairs are a divine punishment. They create a state similar to how one will be restless in hell. La yamutu fiha wa la yahya. A person becomes so overwhelmed by these a love affair or lustful thoughts and lustful glances that inside his heart is like the condition of hellfire. You don't live and you don't die. You're in this continuous state of you're troubled. You're bothered all the time. Similarly, after casting sinful glances, one becomes involved in love affairs. And becomes uneasy. He is completely deprived of peaceful sleep because you're constantly thinking about it. Both in this world, both his worldly and religious life are destroyed through constant distraction. A person loses their job. How many people have lost their job? Sexual harassment. I was reading an article about shaking hands. I was reading an article about shaking hands and there's a woman who was working in the corporate world. She said that she was arguing this, that shaking hands shouldn't be part of the corporate world. We should be like just as they are in Japan. You know, how they just make a gesture and that's it. Why she said that? She said that because of the fact that what if somebody were, and he said, this has happened to me. She said that I was going to a job in the corporate world. Somebody shook my hand and just held my hand two seconds longer. And it felt very uncomfortable for him. This, this, this is a non-Muslim woman. She said, I was in the interview. We were alone. And he shook my hand and he just held my hand for three seconds longer. And I felt very uncomfortable. She's mentioning her experience in the corporate world. And she's saying, I, I just the way that I felt at that moment, it just made me very uncomfortable. And she said, that thing that just three seconds extra, if you're holding someone's hand, that can become a sexual intent. I don't think that it should be part of the corporate world. I think even that much interaction should not be allowed. This is a non-Muslim woman who through her experience is saying that this was something that brought me to a, you know, a high level of being uneasy. Imagine. So, people can lose their jobs just by that a person, he's just holding. People have lost their, their, their jobs. People have lost their, I mean, we hear about sexual harassment cases, sexual molestation cases in religious institutions. A'udhu Billah. In Madaris. In Masajid. In religious institutions. Where religious figures, imams, quote unquote scholars, people of status, rabbis, priests, they have been affected by this. Their religious life is destroyed. Their worldly life is destroyed. Their marriage is destroyed. All because of what? All because of the disease of lust. 
Then he continues to say, if the culmination of casting sinful glances and having love affair is engaging in illicit relations, then both participants become eternally despised. They will not even be able to look each other in the eyes. What does this mean? Imagine that, may Allah save us, but the person who is committing that act and the person who that act is being committed against them, what do they, that person hates himself. They start hating themselves that this act was done to me. I was raped. I was molested. They become despised to themselves. You're destroying the life of a person eternally. And then the person himself also, he knows that he's a lousy person. Big time. He knows he's a very, very bad person. So just as a kind father wants his son to live a life of respect and not be involved in any despicable sins, similarly Allah through His, through his limitless mercy requires that His servants do not become immersed in a despised act to disgrace themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to stay in izzah. Allah wants us to be in izzah, in izzat. Allah doesn't want us to live in dhillat. Allah doesn't want us to do acts which will disgrace us, which will dishonor us. Brothers and sisters, these are things that will lead to our dishonor. It will lead us to becoming disgraced in dunya and akhirah. It's a very sensitive matter. And this is something we have to be very disciplined. The Muslim community, we have to become very disciplined in this because it will escalate. This will escalate slowly. Already, already these things, is, it's, it's not important to have partition. It's not important for men and female and female to be segregated already. This is going, it's going towards that direction. Already the Muslim community is going towards that direction. But what we need to do, no matter what direction it goes in, you have to control yourself. Discipline yourself. Every, every place is not going to be perfect. Every place is not going to be segregated. You're living in America, brother. It's not going to be like that. Where, you know, men are separately and women are separate. No. It's not always going to be like that. You're living in a society which is an integrated society. You have to learn to discipline yourself. You have to learn how to control yourself. You have to learn how to with, you know, protect yourself from, these, from this, these lustful desires. They should live a life of piety and respect and be satisfied with what is halal and be patient in abstaining from haram. The people of this world should cool their eyes with Allah's worship and dhikr. This coolness is everlasting. And the worldly coolness is enveloped by thousands of calamities. And then Shaykh mentions some examples. We go to the next page. Go to page 6. I want to read this. So this first section, it talks about one of the cures. One of these cures is fana'iyat husn there's, uh, there's some people that they like to look at, you know, beautiful models and beautiful girls and beautiful guys, and they, you know, take enjoyment out of that. So Sheikh has a wonderful cure for that. And what does he say? He says that these attractive people that are walking around on earth today will one day be reduced to dust in the grave. After their death, if you happen to open up their graves, you will only find sand. If you ask the dust, which part of, which part of, of you was the cheek? Which part the hair? Which part the eyes? You will still only find sand there. You will not be able to recognize which part was the eye 
Which part was the nose? Which part the cheek? As a test, Allah Ta'ala placed this dust there to see who dies for this beauty and who sacrifices his life for the Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Had his glamour and glitter not been turned to dust, then what test would there have been? Do not be deceived by this glamour. Many Salikeen have been deceived by it and thus they were destroyed. In other words, what is the Shaykh saying here? He's saying that, look, this person that you're looking at, what will be the eventual, what will be the eventual result of every beauty? The eventual result is that person is going to be, right, khak. And Hazrat, he has a poem, very beautiful in Urdu, Kisi khaki pe mat kar khak apni zindagani ko. Kisi khaki pe mat kar khak apni zindagani ko. Jawani kar fida us par ki jisne di jawani ko. Jawani kar fida us par ki jisne di jawani ko. Hazrat says, Rahmatullah alayhi, that kisi khaki pe mat kar khak apni zindagani ko. Don't make your dust turn to dust over something that has been created from dust. Don't destroy yourself because of this where the end result is dust. Jawani kar fida us par ki jisne di jawani ko. Give your jawani, give your youth. Sacrifice your youth for the one who has given you youth. Use your life for good and positive activities. Don't, use your, don't, don't waste your life by running around. Guys are running around after girls. Girls are running around after guys. Where is the purpose of your life? No studies. No deen. No masjid. No family. No work. But our purpose is just running after the opposite gender. Like cavemen. Is this, the, this, is, this is what Allah Ta'ala created us for? Everybody has desire. Everybody has passion. Get married. Get married, fulfill your desires. Now go on with the objective and the purpose of what Allah Ta'ala brought you here in this world for. So if we just think about this, what is the end result? There, there, was, a, there was a funny uh, uh, thing that I was reading online. It was talking about the cures to pornography. So there was one funny guy, he, meant, he, made, he, he mentioned the post. He said, if anybody wants to be cured from this, go to a marathon ran by 80-year-old grandmas. Go to a marathon where 80-year-old ladies, they're doing jogging. And then you just go and, and, and watch the 80, because 80-year-old grandmas, you know, you know there, there's no lustful glances there. Your glance, you, even if you try to be lustful, you can't. So he said, go and, and, and look at the 80-year-old grandmas that are running a marathon. And then realize that this is the end result of all beauty. That 18-year-old girl, she was so beautiful and attractive that you want to go buy it, make, her, make her your valentine. <laughs> but now she's become an 80-year-old grandma. You don't even want to give her a glass of water. She's like, hey, wait, wait a minute. Can you just hold my dentures? Let me just take a sip of water. This is the end result. And this is the sad thing about all of these models and all of these beauties, that when their beauty is done, they're not needed anymore, they're kicked to the side. Bring the other ones. Such, a, you know, such a, an industry of exploitation. And that is what the industry of pornography is. It's the industry of exploitation. They dehumanize human beings. They dehumanize women. So we should remind ourselves that no matter how beautiful this body is, think about the end result. And this is from the Quran, Allah Ta'ala is telling us, amala. We made everything on the face of this earth as a beauty. Allah Ta'ala is saying that this whole world, we have made it beautiful. Why did we make this world beautiful and attractive? To test you, which one is, who is best in good deeds? Are you going to worry, are you going to run after the beauties and the glamour and the glitz of this world? Or are you going to, you know, focus on what is your objective in this world? إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا Everything in this world, we have made it a zina, a beautification. لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا So that we can test who is the best in deeds. Who is going to be focused on his purpose. وَإِنَّا لَجَعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا صَعِيدًا جُرُوزًا And all the beauty that's on this face of this planet, we're going to make it a completely empty, desolate plain. All the beauties, all the lust, all the glamour, all the glitz, all of that is going to be turned into a barren plain. Flat. 
mowed down. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions inna dunya hulwatun khadira inna dunya hulwatun khadira wa inna Allah mustakhlifukum fiha liyanzur kayfa ta'malun. Allah Taala has made this world very attractive, very sweet. And Allah Ta'ala has placed you in this world to test you. Are you going to fall for the beauty? Are you going to fall for the attraction? Are you going to fall for the sweetness? وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مُسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِيهَا فَيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah Ta'ala wants to see how, is your de- how, how do you conduct yourself in this world. فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاء فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاء So therefore guard yourself from dunya and guard yourself from females. This is the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says that the inna inna ma akhwafu ma akhafu ala ummati an nisa. The thing that I fear most for the for the men of my ummat. Ma taraktu, ma taraktu baadi fitnatan adar ala rijali min an nisa. Brothers and sisters, what are the what are the what do these hadiths mean? I have not left a fitna which is more dangerous for men of my ummah than women. I haven't left any fitna greater than this. He's giving wasiyat. The Prophet is giving farewell. That, oh my ummah, let me tell you something. I'm going to bid you farewell. Assalamu alaikum. I'm leaving the world. But remember, there is a fitna that is very, very dangerous. You should watch out. What fitna is that? The fitna of unnecessary interaction with females this is a fitna that will definitely destroy you So, in the matter of, if we go to page 16, the general method of leaving love affairs. Those who are involved in love affairs and wish to come out of this trap but cannot do so. They should act on the following six points. If Allah wills, they will be freed. Number one, use the courage that Allah has given you. And we went over this very briefly last night. There's no magical potion. There's no taweez, right? That's going to make you leave sin. You have to use your courage. You have to guard your eyes. No matter how attractive that young boy or that young girl is, you got to guard your eyes and tell yourself, this is a very shameful thing. I, I will become hated in the sight of Allah and shaitan will make me become zalil. Shaitan will make me zalil. Shaitan will disgrace me. You have to use your courage. To supplicate to Allah to grant you courage. Oh Allah Ta'ala, give me the strength. Somebody might have an attraction towards young boys. Ask Allah, Oh Allah Ta'ala, I am filthy. I have this sickness. Oh Allah, you purify my heart and you give me the strength to stay away from this. Number three, ask the special servants of Allah, especially one spiritual mentor, one shaykh, or the one with whom you consult to make dua for you to attain courage. Number four, take special care in making dhikr. This is extremely important. The Prophet ﷺ mentions that the one who reads this dua, this dhikr, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Anyone who reads this hundred times in the morning, he will be saved from shaitan till the evening. And anyone who reads this, 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 this dhikr in the evening, then Allah Ta'ala will save him from shaitan till the morning. 
When you, so in other words, when you are making these dhikrs, it gives you this spiritual strength to stay away from sin. So, in zikr, there is a great effect in the zikr that we do, in the prayers that we perform, in guarding ourselves. Number five, keep far away from the avenues of sin, physically and with the heart. That is, keep away from all attractive forms. In other words, if you know that there's a party, you're invited to a party, and at that party there's going to be males and females and dancing, and don't put yourself in the middle of that, don't put yourself in that trouble. Don't put your body in that place where you are going to become, you know, incited, where your, your, where your sexual passions are going to be aroused. Don't go to that place. Just like, you know, you have a popsicle, you put it in the sun, it's going to start melting. Take it out of the sun. That popsicle of iman, you can't put it in that environment, it's going to start melting. So you got to stay away from those places where you know that you're going to fall into sin. I wanted to mention something on number five. The Sahaba, they told the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, we like to sit on the side of the roads. Gapshap karte hai, you know, on the side of the road, we just sit there and we have our gapshap. He says, don't sit on the side of the road and do your gapshap. Go sit somewhere else. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we have no choice because that's where our shops are, on the road. Shops are on the road. He said, if you have no choice, then fulfill the haqq of the road. He said, what's the haqq of the road? He says, guarding your eyes and giving the salam. In other words, that if you have no choice but to be in that place, then even the Prophet said that you have to guard your eyes. Don't put yourself in that situation and then everybody that passes by, you know, it becomes a, a hobby. What's your pastime? What's your hobby? Oh, I just check out, you know, females as they walk by and I fantasize about them all day long. Number six, continuously be in the company of a pious person and reform yourself by him. No matter how bad one's condition may be or how severe the desires one may have, one should not lose hope. Never lose hope. Love is a very great asset on the condition that it is used correctly. The engine that has more gas makes the aircraft fly faster. And this is very beneficial if the direction is correct. In other words, this muhabbat, this love, this intensity that you have, don't use it for the wrong thing. That love, that muhabbat, that intensity, you should direct it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a specific procedure, if we go to page 17, Specific procedures to adopt as cure for sinful glances and love affairs. In the following lines, I present the procedure that is included in the booklet Tazkiyah i Nafs, Purification of the Nafs. This procedure has been derived from the Quran, Hadith, and statements of the Awliya. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills one who is involved in sinful glances and love affairs, even if for a very long time will be cured if he practices on this procedure. After constantly practicing on this for a period of time, the Salik will begin to feel that he is treading the path of the hereafter and that heaven and hell are before him. Then the carnal pleasures of this world will seem insignificant. This procedure is a very spiritual procedure. Has anybody, has anybody heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? Have anybody heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? There's also a 12-step program for porn addiction as well and a lot of that it's a, it's, a, it's a system that's set up by Christians and a lot of that has to do with prayers to pray and this procedure as well you are directly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oh Allah ta'ala take me out of this condition and first and foremost the procedure starts with what? Recognizing that you have a problem. That's number one. To know that, look, I have a desire 
and I have an attraction to young boys. Imagine, somebody might have that problem. First, you have to recognize that this is a problem. Don't say, I don't have a problem. No, 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 no. You know, this, this young boy, is, he's a good boy. I, I like young boys. I like to, you know, teach them. No, you don't, you don't like to teach them. You like to look at them in a bad way, in an evil way. You have to admit, first and foremost, that you have this problem. If you're going to say, no, I don't, have, I don't have a problem, you have to admit it. You have to realize it, that this is a sickness. This is a problem. You have to, st you have to stand up to yourself. Oh, nafs, how long are you going to do this? Are you going to do this until you make yourself disgraced in dunya and akhirat? That you become zalil? That you ruin your marriage? That you destroy your public and your private life? I'm not going to let you do that. Man up. Man up to it and accept it that I have this problem. And then after that, once you consider that you have an issue, you have a problem, then you can remedy it. And if you have a problem, you'll be more watchful. Like a person who knows, you know, I have an eating problem. I have an eating disorder. So what? When food comes in front of him, what is he going to do? He's going to be more watchful. He's going to be more careful. No, no, no. I have, I have sugar. I have diabetes. Now when somebody brings a big cake in front of him, what is he going to do? Astaghfirullah. He's not going to do evil glances. He knows that if I'm going to eat this, it's going to be detrimental to my health. So you have to know that you have that problem. If you don't know you have diabetes, you're just going to be eating all the sweets. And he's like, oh, I, I don't know why I'm feeling so sick. You're, you have diabetes. You're diabetic. You shouldn't be eating this. So first and foremost, you should know that you have a spiritual diabetes. I have this problem. So now when the cake and the sweet comes in front of you, you'll be like, oh, okay, okay. No, no, no. I can't be near this. No, thank, thanks, but no thanks. Thank you, but no thank you. I have a problem. So the first and foremost point here, which is very essential, that you have to admit that you have an issue. You have to admit that you have a problem. That is the only way that you'll be able to stay away from it. Otherwise, you're just going to be, you know, you're just going to be easy rolling. You're not going to even worry, be worried about it. And then slowly, slowly, you'll be killing yourself and you don't even know it. Like a diabetic. He doesn't know he has diabetes. Pirbichara, he's eating all of the sweets and halwa and, and then, you know, a minute later, you know, he's getting this chakkar and he's about to faint and his heart is, you know, I'm feeling pressure, I can't breathe and I, what's going on? You have diabetes, you're a diabetic. You shouldn't even be near this, you shouldn't even look at this. Nazaroku bachao, don't look at the cake. Right? Similarly, you have to admit that I have this issue so that you can stay away from these problems. <clears throat> After constantly practicing on this for a period of time, the Salik will begin to feel that he is treading the path of hereafter. Brothers and sisters, I have seen people implement this and it's been very beneficial for them. So we'll go over it mukhtasaran. Number one, Salat al tawbah Okay, I'm not going to read what's here. I'm going to explain it to you so you understand. Then you could read it on your own. So the first thing is Salat al tawbah What is Salat al tawbah It comes in a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that anybody who commits a sin and he makes wudu, فَأَسْبَغَ الْوُدُوءَ وَصَلَّى رَكَعَتَيْنِ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ اللَّهَ A person, he makes, he commits a sin. Then he makes wudu. وَأَسْبَغَ الْوُدُوءَ Perfect wudu. And then he performs two rakat salat. وَاسْتَغْفَرَ اللَّهَ لَوَجَدَ اللَّهَ تَوَّابَ الرَّحِيمَ He makes istighfar. He will find Allah Ta'ala to be forgiving and merciful. You make tawbah, pray to two rakat salat. What will happen? Allah Ta'ala will forgive his sin no matter what he had committed. As long as he does it with a regretful heart. So this is the four, first and foremost thing. Never ever become hopeless. Never lose despair. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah Ta'ala forgives all sins. Don't become hopeless. Indeed, Allah Ta'ala is the most forgiving and merciful. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا there is always hope. So if you see yourself constantly falling into that, no problem. Make isbaghul wudu, perfect your wudu, perform two rakat salat and cry to Allah and say, Oh Allah Ta'ala, forgive me for the sin that I've committed. Make a firm intention not to displease Allah in the future. That's number one. Salatul haja. What is salatul haja? Perform two rakat salat and ask Allah, Oh Allah, I have a haja. I have a need. My need is that I need to come out of my, my lustful state. 
Oh Allah Ta'ala, protect me from myself. Allahumma la takilni ila nafsi tarfata ayn. Oh Allah Ta'ala, do not leave me to my sinful self even for the blink of an eye. Positive and negative dhikr. Positive and negative dhikr means la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. To recite the kalima tayyiba hundred times. And what are, you, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing when you say La ilaha illallah? All ghayrullah is coming out of your heart and you're saying illallah. La ma'buda illallah. Wa la maqsuda illallah. Wa la mashhuda illallah. You're, you're, you're imagining that there is no object because what is a person doing? When you are looking at a beautiful thing, Subhanallah, Ibn Qayyim Jawziyah rahimahullah, he mentions in Dawdatul Muhibbeen, he says, Ishq al-suwar, مِنَ الشِّرْكِ الْمُحَرَّمِ إِشْقُ السُّوَرِ Having the desire to look at these beautiful bodies and looking at them and admiring them is like worshipping of idols. They call them, right? Teen idol. They call, why do they call them idol? Because they're so attractive. Because they completely get your devotion you become attached to them. Because there was one type of love, remember? We were discussing all the different types of love in the Arabic language. One of them is that love which enslaves you. It enslaves. And it makes you like somebody who is, you know, worshipping that thing. So when you say, La ilaha illallah, you're imagining that all ghayrullah is coming out of my heart. La ilaha. There is no ilah. Sometimes, Allah Ta'ala says that, غير, that the other than Allah can become an ilah. أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ Do you not see the one who has taken his own nafs as a god? He has taken his own lusts as a god. So when you say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ Imagine that you are negating that god or that false god that is within you. And reciting the words, Allah Reciting the words Allah, taking the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will, this will generate love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart. Right. And meditation of Allah ta'ala seeing you on page 20. Why is it that we ever commit sins? The reason we commit sins is because we... Right? We, we think that Allah Ta'ala is not seeing us. If we knew that, imagine when you're sitting in a room, alone, watching pornography, why are you doing that? Because you think that nobody's watching you. If you're doing something which is inappropriate, with someone who is inappropriate, why are you doing it? Because you think that nobody's watching you. If you knew there's a camera, camera surveillance, would you be doing that? If you knew the camera was catching every action of yours, if you knew that there was somebody else in the room, would you do it? You wouldn't do it. So the reason why we do it is because we become unconscious of the fact that Allah is khabirun basir, alimun bidhat is sudur, sami'un basirun, alimun. We become un unmindful. And my Shaykh Rahmatullah alayhi gave a very beautiful share. He says, Jo kartahi tu chupke ahle jahan se, koi dekta hai tujhe asma se. Jo karta hai tu chupke ahle jahan se, koi dekta hai tujhe asma se. That thing which you are doing completely aloof and hidden from the entire world, you've closed all the doors, but one window and one door is always open. That is the window of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jo karta hai tu chupke ahle jahan se, koi dekta hai tujhe asma se. Whatever you are doing, completely aloof, cut off from the entire world, and know that one window is always open. That is the window of Allah ta'ala. If Allah wants, Allah may, can disgrace you. May Allah ta'ala save us. So meditating that Allah Ta'ala is seeing you. Next, the meditation of the grave, the meditation of death. This is something that is taught to us by Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَذِ مِنْ لَذَّاتِ الْمَوْتِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, abundantly think about the destroyer of all pleasures. Imagine that if you're doing this, at that moment, death were to come upon you. Did you guys hear about that man in Detroit that was driving 3 a.m. in the morning with his pants off 
looking at pornography on his phone? There was a 60-year-old man driving 3 a.m. Brothers and sisters, this is a very serious issue. Imagine that this is like becoming almost common in our, in our it's, it's everyday news. It's everyday news. He's driving in the freeway, it's 3 in the morning, and he was viewing pornography on his phone and he had his pants off. And he gets into an accident, this happened in Detroit. He gets in an accident and he dies in that state. May Allah Ta'ala save us from an evil end. Can you imagine that? And he dies and then the, 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 you know, the state troopers, they were saying, the, 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 the highway patrol, they were saying that he didn't have his pants on and he had this, these things that he was looking at on his phone. I guess he couldn't wait till he get home. The reality of the matter is, is this is meditating upon death. What if Allah Ta'ala takes my life in this action? What if I die in this state? What if my heart stops in this state and I have all this filth on my, in, on my computer? I have all of this shameless, shameless things on my phone. Meditation of the reckoning. Then ponder for a few minutes that Yawmul Hashr that you'll be standing before Allah Ta'ala to give your account of deeds. And Allah is telling you, O oh, shameless one, Allahu Akbar, Allahumma Hafazna. Did you not have shame that you left me and glanced at others and became inclined to a dying corpse? In other words, did you forget about me? Allah Ta'ala will say, and then you, you, you wasted your life in doing these things. And as for the one who fears the standing before his Lord, and he prevents his nafs from desires, then paradise will be his abode. And think about death as well. Meditation of the punishment of hell. Meditate over the punishment of hell and think that it is in front of your eyes. And speak to Allah saying, Oh Allah, hell is a fire lit by you. Its harm will reach the hearts. The people of hell will burn in long pi pillars of fire. When their skins were burnt and become black like coal, then you change their skins. Baddalna juludan ghayra. Allah Ta'ala says Allah Ta'ala will replace their skins with new skin so that they can continue to taste the punishment. Brothers and sisters, there's a hadith in Bukhari and it says that the Prophet ﷺ, when he went for Mi'raj, he saw a big cauldron. You know what's a cauldron? Dig. We say in Urdu, dig. Dig, you know, it was... It was Boiling. Under it was a fire and it was a huge cauldron, a pot. And this pot, you can see the inside of it from the outside. And what was inside of the pot that was boiling? They said there was the, you could see the bodies, the naked bodies of men and women. And every time this fire would be lit, the bodies would almost flow out of the pot. And every time the fire would come down, then the bodies would fall back inside of the pot. That's how, with its such intensity, the fire would be burning. So then I, he said in Mi'raj, he said, Ya Rasulullah, who are these people? He said, these are the people that commit adultery and fornication. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. Imagine this, think about the condition, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That this will be the condition of the people who are cheating on their spouse. Those who are cheating on their spouse. Those who are involved in fornication. This is the punishment that Allah Ta'ala has ordained. And this is all haqq. وَالنَّارُ حَقٌ وَجَنَّةُ حَقٌ The fire of Jahannam is haqq. These things are real. 
And if we meditate over that, right, what will happen? Right? This will bring about this, this, this fear to guard yourself from this. Number two, page 23, there's another meditation to ponder over the favors and bounties of Allah and speak to Allah. Oh Allah Ta'ala, you've given me so many bounties. Oh Allah Ta'ala, you have given me existence. Without asking, you granted me existence through your bounty. Oh Allah Ta'ala, you've given me a beautiful wife. You've given me children. Oh Allah Ta'ala, you've given me a husband. Oh Allah Ta'ala, you gave me position. You gave me izzat. How am I making myself so zalil by doing this? I am being ungrateful. I am doing nashukri to your bounties. Think about the favors that Allah Ta'ala has given you. That by doing this action, you are actually being ungrateful to Allah Ta'ala's favors. How can I be, how can I be so unfaithful to my wife? How can, be, how can I be so unfaithful to my husband? My husband loves me so much. My wife loves me so much. My children. What if my children were to find out I'm doing this? Page 25, he's continuing. I'm just going, like I said, this is something that, mashallah, if you read it alone, there's a lot of beneficial points. So this is a very in-depth book, but, you know, this gives you kind of the spiritual regimen of how you can, if you're involved in any addiction, if you're going through any uh, problem of evil glances, the disease of lust, this gives you an excellent way of coming out of it. And it says here, safeguarding the gaze. The gaze means the eyes. Those who travel to and from the city should perform two rakat salat al hajjah before leaving the home. They should make dua thus, Oh Allah Ta'ala, I give my eyes and heart in your protection. You are the best of protectors. In other words, leave your house with the intention of guarding your eyes. Don't leave your house with the intention of, you know, you know what new mal is there in the market today? You know? What new mal is being sold in the market today. Let me go check out what's going on in the market today. Don't go with that intention. Our Shaykh Rahmatullah used to say, he says, go outside with qasti adami nazar. Go with the intention of, make intention that I am not going to look. Deliberately. Because if you leave without making any intention, then you will fall into it. If we go to page 26, it says the most important prescription for self-reformation. Listen to this one. Number 26, page 26. The most important formula for reforming the self is to punctually attend the company of a pious sheikh. If somebody says, well, I don't see any pious sheikh, well, find one, because there is. And if you don't see anybody more pious than yourself, then you got another problem. That's called kibr. Okay? There's people that said, no, I, I don't see no pious sheikh. Yeah, because you consider yourself to be the most pious sheikh. That's why. So if you don't find that, then you got kibir. You got another problem. So you got to go and deal with that. Because there is. There's very sincere and good people. You have to find them. Just like there are pearls in the ocean. But they're not open. They're hidden. You got to go open the oyster and you'll find the pearl inside. But there are. There are good people. There are righteous people to get guidance from them. And they will be till the day of judgment. Allah Ta'ala has made it such that they'll be Allah Walis. They'll be pious people till the day of judgment. Sit in their company and get their consultation. Get their guidance. Listen to the discourses of Allah's love. Because reforming the self and remaining steadfast on deen is generally very difficult. It's rather impossible if you don't come in the company of somebody that will be able to help you, create a contact with the friend of Allah with whom one has compatibility. Somebody that you know is close to Allah. And build a relationship with this person and get guidance from them. Look, nowadays what do people do? People go to psychiatrists. Yeah, you know, I'm going to my therapist. I'm going to my psychiatrist. 
This is something which is like the sign of the times, you know. The more, you know, the more taraqi yafta and the more, you know, educated and high class you become, then you become, you know, I'm going to my therapist. It's like something cool, you know. I'm really rich now. Now I can afford a psychiatrist and I can go, go to a therapist. I'm really stressed out. People do that. People go there. It's not something which is bad. MashaAllah, we have Muslim therapists now. Khalil Center. It, provi it provides mental health care for the Muslim community. MashaAllah, this is something very beneficial. But just like we don't see it as an aib, we don't see it as a deficiency to go to a therapist or to go to a psychiatrist to get help. You should not feel ashamed to go to somebody who was qualified in the deen to get help for your deen. This is something that existed in the, from the time of the Prophet. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would ask their condition from the Prophet. And the Sahaba, they would ask their condition, right, from the Prophet. And the Tabi'een would ask the Sahaba. And like this throughout the centuries, each generation would ask the most knowledgeable people of their time. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Make him your religious consultant, your religious therapist. Describe your condition to him and practice the cure he prescribes and have trust in him. Meditation of sinful, the harms of sinful glances. Keep on pondering over the harms of sinful glances. And this is why I think more importantly than anything else, I think this program is important just for us to remind ourselves that guarding your eyes is part of our Islamic tradition. Opposite to what's being kind of portrayed nowadays in the Muslim communities. They don't know, you know, guarding your eyes is not really an important thing. But why not? This is in the Quran. Those people who facilitate that, they are establishing, they are establishing a, a very important dini responsibility. People who say that in the time of the Prophet, the women used to be in the back of the masjid. See? No problem. Oh, so you think that, you know, the, the, the Sahaba were turned around looking at the females? Why don't you mention the whole story? They mention half the story, that in the time of the Prophet, the women used to sit in the back of the, in the, back of the masjid. Why you mention half of the story? Mention the whole story. Mention the whole hadith. How does the hadith go? The hadith is this, that the Prophet wasallam he would be in charge. He was the imam. Sayyidul Anbiya wa, wa Imam al Muttaqeen. He was the pious, most pious of all. He would be sitting and he would turn around. And then he would tell the men, listen to this. There was no partition, but the partition was the Prophet himself through the, the intizam that the Prophet made. And he would say to the, to the men, Makanakum. Makanakum. O men, sit in your places. Let the women leave first. When the Prophet ﷺ would see that all the women are gone and there's no possibility of intermingling, then the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, the women are gone. Now, the men can go. There was this intizam. They mentioned the hadith, but they always mentioned the hadith half. People say that the women were in the back of the masjid. But the women were in the back of the masjid. But in what way? The Prophet would not allow, because everybody's faced forward. The women are there. The men are, are, are in the front and the Prophet ﷺ would be there. He did not, he did not disallow the, 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 the women from coming to the masjid. But the thing was is that there was rules, there was regulations, there was a system. And guarding of the eyes was something that was taken into consideration. Now it's just like completely, no, it doesn't matter. How else is my daughter going to find a good, good husband? I'll, this is, this is the what, you know, people, people coming to the, you know, and then what's the difference between us and Christians? I had a Christian friend. I had a Christian friend. We were just having, we were just having nice conversation. So he was just telling me, you know, what's the best way to, you know, as, as a Muslim, what's the best way to find a good spouse? So I said, you know, knowing good families, having, you know, uh, relations with different families, knowing good families, and then, you know, corresponding with the families that you know, and you get hooked up like that. I said, oh, okay. I said, what about you? He says, brother, finest, nicest girls are in church. Finest, 
nicest girls are in church. That's where I go. I said, oh, I said that's the place of worship. Said, I know, I know, it sounds bad, but, you know, it is what it is. Subhanallah. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You will follow the way of the Yahud and Nasara exactly like one sandal. It, it's exactly identical to the other sandal. You will follow them exactly in the same things that they did. To such an extent that if one of them would go like a lizard inside of a hole, then you would follow them. You would go in the hole as well. If there's going to be priests in the Christian community that are blessing gay marriages, there will be imams in the Muslim community that will do the same thing. There will be, because the Prophet said so. It is going to happen. It's not something which is shocking. If you have the people in the Christian community doing that, there will be Muslim imams that will be having, right? Nikah of, you know, Zayd and Amr. Today we are here for the Nikah of Zayd and Amr. There will be that. The Prophet ﷺ said that. If there were Christian people, and remember one, one thing about Christian history. Do you know the history of, of, of the churches in America? Churches in America used to be segregated. Male and female. That's how churches used to be. Ah, don't need that no more. Now we see the situation is, what is, when you go to church, it's like a, it's like a big party. Everybody's dancing, banjos playing, and you know. People be clapping. I'm like, subhanAllah, is this a concert? What's going on? This is a concert. This is worship. Woman, attractive young woman jumping up and down in front of you. Decked out. Dressed like, dressed to kill. Made up like a doll. And she's jumping up and down in front of you. Yeah, you can make, can you concentrate on your ibadah? Should I be concentrating on your jumping skills or should I be... Qibla, you know? This is, this is the situation. Same thing is going to come in our... Uh, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. But this is, the, this is the promise of the Prophet. Let's not go in that direction. Churches in the 1800s. The men and the women were separate. Say, we don't need this no more. Bring the men and women together. What's the, what, you know, what's the, whole, what's the big deal? And now we have the situations that we have. People don't even go to church anymore to worship. People go to church to find somebody. For themselves the priest is also involved the other men are also involved the married men are also involved Allah Akbar <coughs> self-restraint is a very good thing meditating over the harms of this So, these are just, mashallah, some of the beneficial things. And then in the end, it has certain letters that Hazrat has written. I'll read one of these letters and It says here, page 67. <clears throat> so this is just one letter where a person is writing to the shaykh saying, Hadrat, I make full efforts to save myself from evil glances. 
I, guard, I try to guard my eyes as much as I can. At times, I experience much discomfort in doing this. However, I do not perceive the sweetness of Iman that is promised for doing this. Is there any shortcoming of mine in this regard? So it says that anybody who guards their eyes, Allah will give them the sweetness of Iman. So he's saying that I'm guarding my eyes, I don't feel sweetness. I feel pretty crummy. I feel really lousy. I don't feel halawati iman. You know? So Hazrat's answer, when the nafs experience sorrow at having to abstain from sin, light will develop in the soul. SubhanAllah. This is a very ajib concept. And I had mentioned this last night, that one of the interesting things that I learned from my shaykh is, remember, every sadness is not bad. And every happiness is not good. Sometimes we judge the correctness and the incorrectness of something about, based on how we feel. So when we're sitting with ghayr mahram, or we're looking at certain things that are inappropriate, because it makes me feel good, then it must be good. Just because you feel good doesn't mean that thing is good. Like a person does, is doing drugs. That drugs temporarily makes you feel good. That doesn't mean that that drug is a good thing. That's hurting you. That's harming you. So especially, I, I, this is my message to the youth. I mention this again. Just because something feels good doesn't mean it's good. Somebody might have homosexual tendencies and says, I like a guy. I love him. But I love him. He makes me feel good. Somebody might say this. I love him. You know, Robert makes me feel good when I'm around him. So understand this. The answer to that is very simple. Everything that makes you feel good is not necessarily good. It's not necessarily something which is good for you. And everything that makes you feel bad is not necessarily bad. Here he's saying, I feel sorrow when I'm guarding my eyes and staying away from sin. He said, no problem. A light will develop inside your heart. This is mujahada. Al-mujahada tu miftahul mushahada. This struggle is the key to the realization of Allah Ta'ala's ma'rifah. Protect the physical eyes and the heart, and the eyes of the heart as well. Guard your eyes, physical eyes, and guard your heart. Don't fantasize lustful, d d d lustful d d thoughts. Your perception has not been awakened as of yet for you to feel that, oh, sweetness of iman. Take stock of yourself to see whether you are committing any sin with your eyes, heart, and external self. When you are bestowed with total abstention from sin, your perception will be awakened and you will perceive enjoyment. The fragrance of perfume is perceived when bad smells are eliminated. Subhanallah. So how can you feel the sweetness when you still have darkness or bitterness inside? You have to remove all of that. When that's removed, then you will be able to perceive the light and the blessings of guarding the eyes. However, at times... Despite repenting over past sins, a person does not perceive sweetness and enjoyment. This is, similarly to, this is similar to a person who recovers from malaria. You know, when a person has malaria for quite some time after his recovery, he does not perceive any enjoyment from tasting delicious food. Because you have a sickness in your tongue and in your body. The taste comes back gradually. So similarly... You don't find the enjoyment of prayers. You don't find the enjoyment of guarding the eyes because there's still a little bit of sickness left inside. When you are cured, then you start experiencing the sweetness and the halawa. You should therefore continue abstaining from sins and continue safeguarding your eyes irrespective of whether you perceive any enjoyment or not. You are being bestowed with sweetness, but you are not perceiving it as of yet. May Allah Ta'ala give us understanding. Inshallah, uh, you know, this, is, uh, this book is, uh, you know, for, for all of you. Uh, if some of the places it's difficult to understand, you know, inshallah, this is still undergoing some editing. This has been translated from the Urdu language. So we're trying our best to, inshallah, make it beneficial, um, you know, for the public. But uh, we said that, you know, we wanted to give you a complimentary gift uh, for this, uh, you know, for this program that we have today. Q&A. Do we have time for Q&A? What time is uh, uh, what time is Dhuhr? Okay.
Q&A. They said so. So, the, uh, inshallah, we have about half an hour, 25 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, the number is 630 360 2373. 630 360 Inshallah, if there's any questions that you may have, there's a lot of brothers and sisters here who know family members, friends uh, who might be going through certain issues, and you want to get some advice on their behalf. This would be a, a gr gr you know great place, inshallah, to ask those questions and hopefully get answered. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. Brother, very, very important question. I'm very happy actually that you asked that. We can only touch up, like you said, it's very exhaustive. There's only a few points that we can touch up on, but I'm very happy that you brought that up. The, the, the brother asked a very, um, very appropriate question, which is, I think, very much relevant to our communities, our time, and that is, you know, through social media, you get connected, maybe unintentionally, maybe it's a, um, the, 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 the relationship is just very innocent at the beginning. You're just, you know, forwarding certain posts, you know, on Facebook. You know, you're just forwarding some, you know, interesting thing. And then the relationship is created by posting back and forth. After some time, you don't know that you're caught up in a, you know, in a trap, in a web. And you have feelings for this person. And you're a married, married individual. And I have seen this situation. So one is... First and foremost, that there's many things. So I'm, I'm kind of scattered in the answer to it, but inshallah, I'll try to mention it point form. First and foremost is, what is our concept of social media? This is a very dangerous thing. Because I know a lot of you think that social media is something that, because I am in this private room, and I can see this, and the people are words and pictures, there's, there's this... There's this impersonal aspect of it. So, we, we, you know, this is the first deception that we have to understand that this social media is exactly like a public, like you're at a, like if you were sitting at a table and you're talking to somebody, I mean, would you say those things, right? This is how you have to imagine that this is not a computer, me sitting in the room in front of the internet, and these are like, you know, pictures of people. 
This is, imagine it is an actual table. Imagine if you were like at a fundraiser and, or any type of dawat. You're sitting at a table and there's a person, there's his wife, there's his daughter, there's his you know, mother. Would I say that in a real conversation with, with that person? Would I be so personal? So what happens, I think it's the deception of just the domain. You know, we call it the cyber domain. It's very deceptive because it creates this, this type of barrier where you become more brave, more courageous to share things that you probably wouldn't share in a more, um, uh, in a more like real, non-cyber world, real world. And I'll be very honest with you, um, there was a student, uh, a sister, who was very close to us, and some of the students, they complained that, you know, she wears the hijab. But then on, on the Facebook, she's posting her pictures with, you know, no hijab, makeup. And, and I'll be very honest with you. You probably, should be, I'm so happy you asked this question. I mean, this is something that I actually experienced. You'll be shocked about what I'm about to tell you. I just contacted her with, very, with a lot of mahabba, with a lot of respect. I said, my dear sister, you know, you're like, you're like my little sister. You know, you're going to college. But you know, what's the use of wearing hijab? That you're posting your picture on Facebook with you know, makeup and no hijab. I mean, I said, do you know that the entire world sees you on Facebook? Wallahi, you will not even believe the answer. You will not even believe the answer. Oh, Sheikh, you know, I never thought about it like that. I thought only my friends are seeing that. My girlfriends, yani her, her female friends. I thought only... I thought only my female friends are, are, are seeing that. I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize. Jazakallah khair for telling me. And then she deleted all of them. I was like, you know, we, we think that maybe common sense is not so common anymore. So I think the one aspect is the, the concept that we have of the cyber world that look, once something is on that, it can never be erased. We have to understand that and take responsibility that every post that we are posting, every picture that we are putting up, Every conversation that we are saying, this is something that is being protected and preserved. And remove the veil and imagine yourself to be, this is real world and this has real consequences. I mean, we hear about cyberbullying. You know, there's, there's cyber relationships, but cyberbullying is the same thing where people are just thinking that they're saying simple words. But you're, you know, you're not just saying words, people commit suicide. Because you have five, six people on a talk chat group and they're attacking one person, what happens? That person eventually, you know, they end up committing suicide. So this is something which is not, it's a, it's a very deceptive word. I think that's the first and foremost thing, that if you're talking to somebody who is married, that is just like talking to a married person in real life. If you're not going to say those things to them in real life, do not say those things to them on Facebook. If you would feel comfortable to chat like that in real life, flirt, because that's the type of flirt, flirt flirting. If you would not do that in real life, then don't do it on social media. That's number one, I think. Bringing to realization that point, that the cyber world is a real world and has real consequences. I mean, people can get put to jail from some of the things. I mean, you hear about some of these uh, people that go to the schools and they do the shooting. They look at their Twitter account. They look at their Facebook account. What were their recent posts? Because those are things that people can be incriminated because of that. This is real. This is, the, I think, a very important point. Jazakallah khair for bringing that up. This is a very good point, brother, and this is where we come to the concept of this evil glances thing. Bhaijan, I, I, I really mean this when I say it. This, this concept of, you know, that I should not be looking at somebody else's wife or looking at somebody else's sister, people don't consider it to be a sin anymore. So I think one of the, that, that is the fundamental thing that's there. That has to be, why is there not ghirat? Ghirat? No, there is not because you don't consider that to be a sin. And I think, we, you know, the way that 
and, and, and I'm not blaming it on, on anyone, but the way some of the, the way that the, our, the, the Islamic infrastructure of our communities is happening, we're going in that direction where we don't consider this to be such a big deal anymore. You understand? So that's one point. But I wanted to continue on that point with the brother mentioned. The second thing, which I think is one of the leading causes, it might be just like we say, be'ehtiyati. Be'ehtiyati is like, you know, uh, being uncautious. That's one. We should be cautious. And I think if you consider the cyber world to be a real world with real consequences, you'll have more ihtiyat. But I think there's another leading cause and brothers and sisters, especially brothers, sisters as well, but especially brothers, please take this into consideration if you're married. And like you said, you know, you've been married for a long time and you know that there are certain stages in marriage. You know, I've been married for about 20 years now, almost 20 years. And there are stages in the marriage where, what, what, you know, you, um, you kind of uh, become... Uh, you know, you reach that stage in your marriage where things kind of become bland. You know, things get boring. Now you want to spice it up and you want something new and you want to have feelings and you want that fire and you want that desire and you want that passion again. So brothers and sisters, we have to be aware of our spouse's needs and desires. Sometimes when that need is not being fulfilled through the spouse, then the husband or the wife will see that that need will be fulfilled through other avenues. That need, we need that. There has to be muhabbat, there has to be love, there has to be passion, there has to be desire. And don't be afraid. And I say this to the sisters, I apologize. Brothers, I know this is, I feel kind of uncomfortable because <laughs> I keep saying this. But I, I hope, you know, I don't know, maybe some people didn't expect it to be so kind of, straightforward and, and graphic, but I have to say this to the sisters, if your husband requests you to dress a certain way, if your husband requests you to do something which is not outright haram, don't say, you know, I'm an old lady now, I have kids, I don't want to do that. Who else is he going to do that with? Who else is he going to fulfill his desire with? And I seen this, you know, this was a very unfortunate issue in one of the a very, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, it was a very conservative Muslim community that the men of that Muslim, conservative Muslim community, you know, they became involved in prostitution. You know, and one of the reasons was the fact that, you know, pornography and badnazari and evil glances was definitely a factor. But another factor was the fact that the wives are just like, You know, sorry, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that, and I don't feel comfortable doing that, and so on and so forth. Again, there are certain things that are blatantly haram. There are certain things that, you know, a man might ask his wife, "I want you to do this," or "I want to do this," because he's seen something which is in, 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 inappropriate. But, for example, the the emotional needs. Why is a woman talking to a strange man? Because maybe you don't have time to speak with her. Maybe you don't have a time, you don't want to listen to her. Maybe you think that, you know, she talks too much or she's nagging. So, because she's not getting that emotional need fulfilled by her husband, or he's not getting his emotional or sexual needs fulfilled by his wife, he is going to seek it somewhere else. So, I think that amongst husband and wife, we should be very sensitive to the needs and very sensitive to the wants and the desires of our spouse. Be very careful about this. And I think, inshallah ta'ala, if we do that, that will be something that will, that will you know, be a solution to the problem, inshallah I think these two points are, are, are fundamental. Very good, very good point and very saddening. Um, yeah, the question is that, you know, what about those people that have been sexually harassed or sexually molested? And because of that abuse that they experienced in their life,
For example, they leave Islam or they completely take off hijab or they go into sin or they completely you know, leave the Muslim community. Will those people be held accountable for their leaving Islam or will the... Now, it's, it's, a, very, you know, it's a very simple answer that the committing a sin does not you know, make it right the fact that the sin was committed against that person it does not justify that person coming out of Islam. It does not justify that a person should, you know, oh, because this was done to me, I'm never going to wear hijab again. What does that have to do with that? Your wearing hijab is not because of anything else. Your wearing hijab is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the commandment of Allah ta'ala. Right? That is the commandment of Allah ta'ala. You know, you being a Muslim, right? that is the hukum of Allah ta'ala. You do not lose your iman because of something that was done upon you. This is a struggle. But, you know, again, I know how traumatizing it can be. I've dealt with people that have been in that situation. But in that situation, we have to be able to separate my relationship with Allah and my relationship with the creation of Allah. Just because creation of Allah has done me wrong doesn't mean I have to leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand what I'm saying? And I know this is something... Uh, 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 something very difficult But this is a way that shaitan wants to uh, Make a person That that sin was committed Sin was committed on that side By the abuser And now the abused is committing another sin So That sin Does not justify this sin And you are still held accountable For example I'll give you another example Very clear, clear cut Explicit example Somebody goes inside of a school, he takes a machine gun and he kills 50 people. Is this the sign of the times or no? Do we hear this? Almost like every other month or every other year, something like this is happening. Now, the person is caught, he's taken to a court of law and then he says, you know what? The reason why I did this was because, you know, I was molested. I was abused. Is he going to be off the hook? Is he going to be off the hook or no? No, he's not going to be off the hook. You're, you being molested and you having a problem That's a different issue How does that justify you killing this, these people? How does that justify you, you becoming so bitter That you become a kafir That you leave Islam That does not justify That sin was his sin And he will be answerable for that And Allah will punish him for that If he does not make tawbah He will be accountable In the court of Allah And he is accountable by law By the law of the land But you, you will be accountable for your sin You'll be, account, you'll be accountable for your guna. Why is that? How can that be a solution? And if, you, if the shaitan comes, that this will be a solution. This will make you feel better. No, it's not going to make you feel better. So remember that we have to be able to separate between the, the sin that was perpetrated and the sin that you are, that, that you are perpetrating. Khudai na khasta, if you become... The one that was the abuse. Does that, does that make sense? I know it's very hard. I know it's, 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 I don't want to sound insensitive when I say it, but that is the fact of the matter. If the judge says, you know, you were, a child, you were molested as a child, that does not justify for you to kill all these people. That's not insensitivity. That's a matter of fact. That is how the law works. So we have to be able to cut the, you know, we have to separate the lines. Yeah. Yeah, let's take some questions. <clears throat> How do you deal with handshaking with the opposite gender in a corporate meeting setting? So, I don't know how other scholars deal, deal with it, but the reality of the matter is, is that I've been in a many situations where, you know, sister has put their hand out, and I just put my hand on my chest, and I said, I apologize, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I am not able to, uh, to, to uh, shake your hand. Um, you know, I just, uh, this is my religious, you know, uh, I have religious restrictions in that regard. I, I really apologize. So, I mean, they understand. So, a person shouldn't be, um, a person shouldn't feel shy in that regard. Uh, people are generally understanding. You understand? MashaAllah, Hazrat gave us a very beautiful ilaj. Be careful though with that one. I think Hazza can get away with it, but I, I think if anybody else tries that one, you know, you might get in trouble. He said that, uh, you know, uh, 
He said, you know what I say? You know, I try to abstain from shaking hands with very beautiful women. So when you say beautiful women, you say, oh, I'm a beautiful woman? Oh, thank you so much. That, that, you know, that, that, that removes the bitterness of not shaking my hand, that I'm beautiful. So you, you know, slipped in a compliment in there, you know? <clears throat> How can we know as a parent if our kids are involved in fornication? One advice that I have to parents is the parents have to change their status as parents. You need to become friends with your kids now. In this day and age, don't be just a parent. You know where we come from? You know, you wouldn't have long conversation with your parents. You just figure it out. Some people were like, you know, super deadly afraid of their dads. My dad would just look at me. And that's it. You know, that was the end of it. Like, that doesn't work here. You can't be like that here. It worked for us. You know, it worked for me. My, my grandmother would just look at me. Yeah, you look at them, you're looking at them, you're looking at them. <laughs> and they're just, you know, doing more and more. They don't understand. They don't have, they don't understand the ishara. They don't even understand ibara. Al aqil takfi al ishara, wal ghabiyu la takfi al ibara. The aqil ishara and, and, and making an indication is enough for them. But a person who is, you know, kind of like doesn't get the picture, you even tell them they won't understand. So, how do you know that your kids are involved in that? First and foremost, you should be more involved. Be their friend. Don't just. Don't just, look, don't have this mentality. I'm going to raise my kids the same way my parents raised me. No, you're in a different situation. You're in a different setting. You're in a different society. You're in a different time. There was no internet. Can you believe we were the last generation without internet? Internet came around in the scene when I was like 16 years old. Meaning the major portion of my life when I was growing up as a kid, we were actually riding bikes and playing stickball outside. Remember those days? Wow, that was fun. You know, we used to leave when the sun would rise and we used to come home when the sun would set. There was actually, that was actually a time. That time doesn't exist anymore. Imagine how the world has changed. So we have to, the parents have to realize that. If you don't realize that, then you got an issue. As a parent, how best do we tell our kids that homosexuality is wrong in our deen, contrary to what society says, or they hear from people of high status, etc.? Well, first and foremost, like I said, the most difficult things can be explained if parents are like friends with their kids. And we sit, like me personally, when I sit with my son, I talk about, I mean, he's eight years old. He's pretty young. But I talk to him about a lot of things. And when I have the opportunity to talk to him about a lot of things, when I'm picking him up from school. And at that time, when I'm speaking to my son, you know, I try to mention certain things to him, which are very fundamental. So... We have to have a time where we open up with our children. And I know this is something which is extremely hard. But where there's a will, there's a way. We have to create an environment. Parents have to create an environment. If you've, you know, haven't done it yet, you know, and the early ages have passed, it's still not too late. But if you don't have kids yet and you're raising your kids, have a time with them where you're able to discuss with them these issues one by one and, you know, be able to talk with them about these things and tell them you know as it is like you would speak to a friend it's hard to explain things to somebody who is not a friend but if somebody becomes like a friend it becomes very easy so first and foremost you have to build that relationship with your children and i think you know this is what i've experienced in my life and i'm you know i 
I haven't seen the result of it yet. Maybe Allah Ta'ala, you know, may Allah Ta'ala make my children pious children. But, you know, this is the best way that I've seen it. Be friends with them. Befriend them. And then the most difficult things, it becomes very easily explainable. So the question is, Shaykh, how does one not fall back into sin if we left something? Someone, friends, for the sake of Allah. And what is right? How do we do? How do we become strong enough to fight nostalgia and not relapse in a sin? So, I'll tell you, I tell you something that happened to me the other day. I never wear my seatbelt. Please don't do that. I'm not a good example. So, my son always tells me, Hey, Baba, you always tell me. You know, to put on my seatbelt, how come you don't put on your seatbelt? So lo and behold, Allah Ta'ala, you know, showed me. And I was driving and my son sitting next to me. So poor guy in the back, he has a seatbelt on. And I'm like, you know, jungly, I don't have my seatbelt. So then a cop stops me and says, you know, sir, you know, do you notice you don't have your seatbelt? Oh, you know, I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize, you know, what's going on. I don't have a habit of doing that. So he said, okay, license registration. He came back and wrote me a ticket. So after that, I've been wearing my seatbelt, you know. So moral of the story, <laughs> moral of the story, right? That if you were ever doing something, you know, think about the harm that was caused. Think about the punishment. Think about the penalization. You know, let me run this red light. Nothing's going to happen. Let me run this stop, you know, stop sign. Nothing's going to happen, right? Yeah, you think nothing's going to happen. You know, it feels good to be lazy, but then remind yourself of how you suffered. And this is called the pain-pleasure technique. What was the pain that you underwent? And that's the, whole, that's the whole purpose behind penalizations. You get penalized, so you feel the brunt, and you feel the pain of the wrong that you did, so that you won't do it again. So you remind yourself, what was the pain that I went through? Don't think about the nostalgia, think about all the, all the, all the things that, that made you suffer. How you were failing your classes. How miserable you were, how zalil and how you know, despicable you felt, how guilty you felt. Do you want to feel like that again? Don't think about the nostalgia. Shaitan is going to bring back the nostalgia. Shaitan is not going to bring, the back, bring back the thoughts of how miserable you were, how much of a loser you had become, how distant you had become from your parents and your loved ones because you were involved in that sinful relationship. Think about that and say, oh Allah, I've learned my lesson. I don't want to go through that misery. I don't want to go through that pain anymore. Remind yourself of that. How can you guide, guard your gaze in a college environment, especially when other Muslim guys are freely looking? Right? Don't sit in those places where females are frequently, you know, frequenting that area. Don't sit, number one, don't sit in that area. And don't sit there with a deliberate intention to look. If your glance falls upon somebody accidentally, فَإِنَّ لَكَ الْأُولَى وَلَيْسَتْ لَكَ الْآخِرَةِ The Prophet ﷺ told Ali رضي الله عنه يَا, يَا عَلِي إِنَّ لَكَ كَنْزًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّكَ لَذُو قَرْنَيْهَا فَلَا تَتْبِعِ النَّذَرَةَ النَّذَرَةَ فَإِنَّ لَكَ الْأُولَى وَلَيْسَتْ لَكَ الْآخِرَةِ أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told Ali He said, oh Ali, إِنَّ لَكَ كَنْزًا فِي الْجَنَّة Indeed, O Ali, Allah Ta'ala has prepared for you a treasure in Jannah. And you will be the Dhul Qarnayn of that treasure. Yani, you will be the possessor of that. But how are you going to get that? You're not going to get that muft. You're not, not going to get that treasure so easily. فَلَا تَتْبِعِ النَّذَرَةً النَّذَرَةً So don't let your first glance be followed by another glance. In other words, don't go to school, you know, with the intention of checking out the honeys. Don't do that. Don't go to school. Go out with the intention that I'm going to guard my eyes today. If the other brothers are, you know, freely looking, try not to be around those people that don't have those values. I know it's difficult. I know this is something which is very hard. This is something which is very hard. But guard yourself. Don't sit in a place where they're frequenting. Don't do the deliberate glance. Don't intentionally sit there to check out everybody that's going by. And when you sit in class, focus on your dars. 
Don't be focusing on anybody else. As long as you keep it business related. If you have to deal with somebody, then talk to somebody as is the necessity. You don't need to tell an extra joke. You don't need to be flirtatious. You know, you don't need to say, that's a really beautiful blouse you're wearing, you know, that makes your, you know, brings out your eyes. You don't need to say that. What was that? That was unnecessary. Go buy your milk and leave the place. Why do you have to say the comment about the blouse? You know, your blouse really makes your eyes stand out. That was unnecessary. So if you're going to have to deal with the females, deal with them to the extent of necessity. The necessity is equal to the extent of necessity. Don't go beyond their limit. Do what you need to do, and if you don't have to look, then don't even look. But sitting there deliberately and positioning yourself, you know, Allah Ta'ala forgive me. Please forgive me guys if I say certain things that are, you know, kind of. But these things, you know, sometimes, what, what, what can I do? You know, there's a guy at the park. I was just watching him. There was a guy at the park, an old man. Old, old man. Be Sharam. Right? He's sitting there like this. And, and then every female that's walking by. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every lady that's going by, he's just watching them, every single one of them as they pass. And I'm like, you know, like this is your hobby, you know, in the end of your life, this is how you're going to spend your ret ret retirement? That's disgraceful. And this is, this, is not, this is not a hobby that he picked up now. That's a hobby he picked up in college. He picked that up in high school. And he doesn't even realize these are ahadith. It is in our tradition. Again, I keep emphasizing that. In the Muslim community, we don't consider guarding of the eyes to even be part of our Islamic tradition. Forget that. It's part of the Christian tradition. It's in the Bible. Okay? Allah Ta'ala says, قُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ بِنَ بصارهم. So I want to re keep reiterating that point. That we should understand this. That this is something that you know, Allah Ta'ala requires of us that we shouldn't be passing our days and nights in deliberate evil glances. Mm. How do we explain transgender and homosexuality in terms of the Quran and Sunnah? Look, this matter of homosexuality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah Ta'ala says that I have created this nafs and this nafs has been inspired with the inclination to do evil and this nafs has been inspired with the inclination to do good Allah Ta'ala says that our hearts are inclined towards certain evil tendencies we can be born. If a person says, well, you know what? I was born gay. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't even disagree. You know when people say, we're born gay. Absolutely right. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah Ta'ala has inspired the nafs with inclination to commit sin. And Allah has inspired the nafs with the inclination to do good deeds. My Shaykh Rahmatullah says, first sins are mentioned, then good deeds are mentioned. A person can have the inclination to commit sin. Yes, that's natural. But there are certain inclinations that by the law of the Quran and Sunnah, it's something which is against the divine plan. What is the divine plan? That God created man and God created woman. And these man and woman, in a relationship of love, they are joined with marriage. And one of the purposes, the essential purposes of this divine plan is that this man and this woman will procreate and bring people in the world that will worship Allah and that will be good citizens in this world. That is the divine plan. So in this divine plan, male and male is not in that plan. Whether we are Christian or Jew or Hindu, there is a consensus in that regard that there is that divine plan and the relationship between two men is not in that plan. Now beyond that, how do we deal with such people? How do we deal with such people? Just like we deal with any other human being, with respect. 
Is a person who is homosexual not deserving of respect? I should not do mu'amala with that person? I should not treat that person with the rights and the respect that they are due as a human being? No, I do. I will deal with that person. That person is at will, how they want to practice their life. And this is why, brothers and sisters, what doesn't make sense to me, look, what you do in your bedroom, that's your business. Why are you bringing it in my face? And why you want me to accept that? I cannot tell you that this is something that I agree with and I accept it. I'm sorry. That is not permissible. That is against the, that is against the divine plan of God that we believe in, who we believe in. Now what you do in your private time, you do what you want to do. Whether I agree with it or not, are you judging me? Do you want to judge me? Do you want to gauge where I stand? You have no right to do that. Just as much as you have a right to be a homosexual in this country, I have a right to not be a homosexual and to consider it a sin. But you want to eliminate that, then for who is their rights then? Who has rights? I don't have a right? There, we live in a multicultural world, but I'm not so wanted here because if I say that, no, I don't want my kids to hear that. And I don't want, my, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know about your private life. I mean, guys, girls, brothers, sisters, do I go around saying, yes, everybody, I just want, to, I want everybody to know that I am married to a woman. I am heterosexual. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. No, no applause. What? That's my own, that's my own, that's my prerogative. I mean, how, how dumb would I look? I'm making this announcement. Everybody, I just want to let everyone know this. I'm a heterosexual. Who cares? Do your, what you do, that's your business. Now people look up, you know, I'm coming out and I'm, I'm, you know, and they're proud about it and they're, keep it to yourself. I don't want to know about that. And if you want to compel me that I have to consider that to be something which is righteous and to believe that that is something good, no, I will not consider that. And that is my right. That is my right as a citizen. That is my right as a human being. And I am, I am also, right, I am also obliged shara'an to the extent of my ability to enjoin good and forbid evil as well. I am obliged to the extent of my ability to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. So if we're living in a, we talk about we're living in a multicultural world, right? It's not really that multicultural, it's not really that diverse because they're trying to, you know, if, if you say that, you know, you don't accept it and you don't agree with it, then there's a judgment that is passed about you. Where is the multicultural about that? This is something which is established in our faith. There is no difference of opinion about this. This is a matter that there is no difference of opinion about. So it's something very, very clear. Let's be honest with ourselves and be honest with, you know, the people. As far as you, you're a homosexual, you know, I respect you as a human being. As for the action that you're doing, I do not agree with that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا What about if the person is Muslim? You have a temptation. You have a struggle. More than the struggle of somebody else. I have seen my shaykh deal with people that have homosexual tendencies. Wallahi, I've seen my, our mashayikh give more respect and love to those people. Treating them as somebody who needs to overcome that struggle. That is a struggle that you need to overcome. Don't just do whatever your nafs tells you to do. Somebody else will tell you, well, I'm attracted to young boys. I was just born that way. Yeah, you're born that way. You need to guard yourself from that. Well, I was, you know, I was born with that, you know, the inclination, I just like to kill people. You know, what can I do? That's just my inclination. Well, you need to control yourself because this is not in accordance with the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. This is not in accordance with the law of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Well, I just have a natural inclination. I like to shoplift. I like to just steal things. So if I like your watch, I'll just take it from you. I'm sorry I was born that way. Well, you know, you're born that way. You need to overcome that problem because it's, gonna, it's against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qanun. So these are just some things. May Allah ta'ala give us the tawfiq to understand what has been said.
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasul Allah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasul Allah. Hayya ala al-salah, hayya ala al-salah. حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استوى واحتذلوا الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر, 
الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم وطيبه اللهم لا إله إلا الله اللهم أنت السلام السلام رحمتك يا رحم الرحيم. Those of you who just joined us uh, at Salat al-Dhuhr, uh, you probably know, mashallah, noticed some program was going on, so alhamdulillah, we've culminated uh, the seminar with Sheikh Tamim Ahmadi, may Allah preserve him, uh, on the Sinful Glances, the book, three, three booklets of the Sheikh, and uh, the presentation was done, and the books, I think there's still some available if you didn't get one. Sinful Glances in Love Affairs, The Harms and Cures, which Mona uh, Tamim translated and, and published right now. So if you'd like to um, get your free copy and, and read and benefit from it, you can do so, inshallah ta'ala. Those of you who missed the program, it's going to be uploaded to our website under the seminar section, inshallah. Last night's seminar as well as this seminar that we just completed. Please uh, take the time out, inshallah ta'ala, and benefit from that. Uh, and from on behalf of the entire Darussalam staff, administration, community, and supporters, we'd like to... Uh, thank from our, uh, Sheikh Tamim from the bottom of our hearts for taking the time out traveling here and coming here last night It's not like he slept late. Actually. He slept after Fajr Salat today for three hours the entire night He was awake with students and people who are present here last night